Good morning. My name is Lisa Clinch. It's my honor to be your liturgist this morning. I'd like to welcome each of you here today, particularly those visiting us for the first time. We invite you to stop by the hospitality room after the service, and there you will find a bag to take with you that contains some information about Enum United Methodist Church. It is our hope that you feel welcome here and that you will visit us again. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude. Our gospel lesson for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31, and can be found on page 848 of your Pew Bible. The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction, but for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. This is the way God works, and most powerfully as it turns out. It's written, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose so-called experts as crackpots. So where can you find someone truly wise, truly educated, truly intelligent in this day and age? Hasn't God exposed it all as pretentious nonsense? Since the world in all its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God, God in his wisdom took delight in using, the world cons- in using what the world considered dumb, preaching of all things, to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. While Jews clamor for miraculous demonstrations and Greeks go in for philosophical wisdom, we go right on proclaiming Christ the crucified. Jews treat this like an anti-miracle, and Greeks pass it off as absurd. But to those who are personally called by God himself, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's ultimate miracle and wisdom all wrapped up in one. Human wisdom is so tinny, so impotent, next to the seeming absurdity of God. Human strength can't begin to compete with God's weakness. Take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses, chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies? That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate and a fresh start, comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. 
That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. The word of God. Sometimes in an effort to get as many people as possible to follow Jesus, I have, with good intentions, made following him sound as attractive, as appealing as possible. And so I've talked a lot about the unconditional joy, the peace that passes understanding, the grace and mercy that frees us from all of our guilt and shame. Those things are true and they are beautiful and they should be spoken of often. But I've realized that I have been guilty of selling Jesus. I've emphasizing only the parts about Jesus that I thought people would like. Imagine it this way. Imagine if my oldest daughter grows up and goes to college and after a number of years isn't married, but she really wants to be. And so I decide to help the process along. And I take out an ad in the newspaper and I put up a billboard sign and print up t-shirts begging someone to come and choose her. Wouldn't that cheapen who she is? Wouldn't that make it seem like they were doing her a favor? I would never do that. If you want to come and get to know her, you better come with everything you've got, or I'll send you back in. I put this comfortable chair up here because I thought it was a good good place to sit, and you all probably would are kind of upset because you're sitting on those pews and they might not be as comfortable as this comfortable chair. Where did you find this, Mark? This is a... Oh, it is in the lounge. Oh, so we, we have borrowed lounge furniture and we put it up here and it's very comfortable. So if you don't mind, I thought maybe this morning I would just be... I would have a comfortable seat. Because we're, we're going to talk about the comfortable cross and how we... Um, and Kyle mentioned in that video clip, I'm sorry it was a little dark for you to, to see it properly, but... Um, mentioned in that video clip that we sometimes water down what it is to follow Jesus. And we've been talking about whether we're followers or fans. And we water down what it means to be followers and what the cross really is. And so we make things be comfortable for people to the extent that we've probably watered down the whole message, missing what the message really is. So... We like comfort. Most of us like comfort of some sort. We like comfortable beds, and you have Tempur-Pedic and and foam mattresses and all these things that give us great comfort. And one night while I was gone, and Mom and I had gone back to her house that she had moved from to do some more packing, um, my brother left an air mattress, and she said, we decided to stay the night. And she said, there's an air mattress there that you can sleep, sleep on. And I thought, if I blow it up and I, I get it out, I have to put it away and we're doing all this packing and I'll just sleep on the floor. I got to tell you that my days of sleeping on the floor comfortably for possibly gone. That was not a very comfortable space to be. The air mattress would have had at least some kind of support. So we like comfort. We, we, we do all sorts of things to be, um, to be comfortable in air conditioning to make it nice in our cars, in our houses, and um, we want service to be quick, and, and we have cars that have all sorts of comfort in them. We like comfort. So the message of the cross, though, We've kind of let that fall, that comfortable cross, be something that we've also um, ended up having. You see, the cross, if it's a comfortable cross, it's 
we wear the symbols of the cross and we, and we might um, have pretty crosses in uh, various places in our, in our homes and we have, uh, we have a cross hanging up. And we make the message of the cross be something that becomes just familiar to us. Jesus chose the cross, and in Israel, you'll, you'll find that to, to many, it was a symbol of weakness. It wasn't a symbol of something that we know of it as at the moment, of how we look at it. But it was a symbol of um, even ridicule, because the crosses, when you were hung on the cross, it was the worst form of punishment, but it was also a very humiliating space, because they, if the... Um, words are are true. They placed the crosses in places that uh, everyone could see. And so the cross that Jesus would have died on would have been in a pathway where people would have traveled, where they could have stopped and mocked and scorned the people that were hanging there. It wasn't a pretty picture. It wasn't at all comfortable And Jesus chose that space, what was considered weak and wasn't considered to be um, a good thing at all. Jesus chose the cross as his method of bringing life and doing something powerful through the cross. Last week when Mark talked to you and he used the Rubik's Cube and showed how out of a scrambled Life, God can create something beautiful, and He changed the Rubik's cube into all the sides had crosses on them. By God's grace, we are made whole and we are saved. And so, looking at the cross a little bit differently is if we are followers. We've looked at the scripture many times over the last few weeks. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Taking up your cross, we use that, that, that um, phrasing. You know, I took up my cross, I bared my cross for you, but we don't really have it, right? It's used sometimes in people's language, but it's not really what the Lord is talking about. Denying ourselves is allowing God to be in charge of who we are and allowing God to to take us and use us and make us. And so it isn't it isn't being comfortable. He takes us clearly out of our comfort zones. At one point during our, our messages, one of the scriptures that came to my mind on our journeys as we've been taking journeys and we're now in this space of being fans or followers, the scripture that came to my um, heart and was on my mind and continues to push at me is, is the scripture that says, do not be anxious about anything, but in all things give thanks. And I continually have that scripture be reminded to me. And at one point this week, I, I, I had in my um, thoughts and I said, you know, Lord, why, why did you write that scripture? And, and um, you know, for a very good reason, he writes it. Do not be anxious. Trust in me. That means that we give up our control and we, we simply lay it all before the Lord and we become those followers of his. And it isn't always comfortable to be in those spaces. And so God is, is teaching us and Jesus is teaching us that if you want to be followers, You need to deny yourself. You need to surrender you. You need to get out of the driver's seat and allow the Lord to lead you and guide you and to trust that in the areas that aren't very comfortable, he's with you. And so he uses, he uses the image. He uses the cross. And so, um, Several, a few years ago, my son were, and his family went to um, Vietnam, and they served with Orphan Voice, and at some point I may share more about that with, with you, but they served for three months with Orphan Voice, a Christian 
orphanage that is in Vietnam. And Christopher found, uh, he takes pictures and does different things and is, is a worship pastor in pastoral care in Pennsylvania. But he found crosses and in, in, has found crosses in various spaces where things are broken and not in good shape, but in the midst of that is this cross of a reminder of what God's grace can do in finding beauty in those spaces. What God did on the cross, what, what is, how did that affect you? And so that's how, what we're talking about this morning. And in your, um, in your scripture lesson this morning, the message, it says, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So to many it is foolish, but to those of us, who find life and are saved, it is the power of God. And as you heard this morning, the scripture says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. And for the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. And so Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. God didn't choose what we might think would be what he should have chosen, but he chose something that was thought as, as foolishness. And he trusts us. What we need to do is to surrender all of ourselves to, to the Lord. So who else but God could take a cross that represented defeat? Because that's what it was. You had to have done really horrible things to have been crucified on the cross. God takes that symbol of defeat and he turns it into a symbol of victory. And so that cross that we see is is not defeat but victory. God takes the cross that represented guilt and he turns it into a symbol of grace. And so if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we see that cross as a symbol of God's grace, setting us free from our sins. God takes the cross that represented condemnation and turns it into a symbol of freedom. So as you look at the cross, maybe you see that symbol of freedom in that space. God takes the cross that represents pain and suffering and turns it into a symbol of healing and hope. God takes the cross that represented death and turns it into a symbol of life. And so what God did on the cross, he can do also for you. We'll take that away. Um, Will you, like Christ did before us, trust God enough to let your weakness be his strength? Throughout the Bible, it shows people who had key weaknesses that God used and gave strength to to change the situations that they were in and gave them power. Will we allow God to use our weaknesses and to make use them with strength? And that's the message of our of of the cross. Are we able to do that? Are we able to allow God to use our weaknesses? Most of us like don't like to admit that we have weaknesses in the first place. But sometimes it's good to admit that we need help or that we, we can't do it by ourselves and that we need the strength that comes from not our own being, but that comes from the Lord. There's a good image of that. Um, in the image is Kyle Eidelman, who you saw in that picture, his son wanted to show that he was grown up and he was big and he's just a little guy and he's, 
carrying his backpack and they're on a trip and on a vacation and he's carrying his backpack and he's going to be strong and it's night and they had parked kind of a long ways away from where they needed to go into the entrance to the hotel and he's tired excuse me this little guy is tired and he's weary and he puts on his backpack and he doesn't go very many steps and he turns around and he looks at his dad and he hands it to his dad Pretty soon he turns around and he looks at his dad and he puts his hands up and his dad picks him up as well. You know, folks, that's what we need to do. We need to allow to God to give our weaknesses to the Lord and allow him to use them and be our strength. On our own, we can't do it, but with the Lord we can do all things because he strengthens us and gives us that strength. So what is the meaning of the cross for you? Is it just something you look at and it's just nice and it's a symbol? Or is it something that you you recognize that there is power in, in that space that God gave to us? That Jesus died to give us life. That Jesus died so that, that we could have communion with, with God the Father. What is that message of the cross for you? If it's just something we wear around our neck or put on our bumper sticker or we look at, then we might have missed what it is. And we might have missed what we are asked to do, but to deny ourselves, to to surrender our own selves, and to take up that cross and follow Jesus. So where are you with the cross? Is it just comfortable? Is it just that sign? Is it just pretty to look at? Or have you recognized that God took what was foolish and made it into something that is all powerful? Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that you can take our weaknesses, you can take the things that the world considers foolish. And you can make powerful things from them. Lord, you took, in the Bible, you took folks who did not trust or didn't believe. And you took their weakness and you changed it into something powerful. You took Moses who could not speak and he stuttered and you allowed him to make a huge difference of leading the people out of captivity. Lord, you used David, who who was a wonderful worshiper, but was also committed sins in your eyes. But you took him and you allowed him to do great things. All through the Bible, Lord, you took people who had weaknesses, but you took them And you allow them to serve you in powerful ways. Lord, remind us that you take our weaknesses as we surrender ourselves to you and we deny ourselves and we surrender. You take us and you use us in powerful ways. Lord God, we thank you for what you do. We thank you for the the sacrifice on the cross. It was the worst form of torture ever. And you chose that way to die so that we might have life. May we use that gift to to make a difference in the world for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.